Welcome. Welcome to the second in our uh, Battle for Auckland mayoral series. Uh, this morning we have uh, Leo Malone with us who's going to run through his, his vision for Auckland and uh, the reason why he should be the mayor. Uh, this follows on from our one last week with Wayne Brown. We have uh, Viv Beck next week, Fesso Collins the week after, and Craig Lord the week after that. But now I'll hand over to my colleague from the Parnell Business Association, Cheryl, to do intros and welcome. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, I would like to just welcome you on behalf of the New Market and Parnell Business Association and also present uh, Ponsonby, K Road and Uptown Business Associations and obviously some of our members. And can I also welcome members of the media who will have a media panel later. So obviously we, we're all very interested in the upcoming um, mayoral elections because it impacts on us greatly. Um, and um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Leah Malloy and to just um, talk about the format of the session we're going to have Leo talk to us, and then CEO of New Market, Mark Knopf Thomas, will handle the media panel and questions. So please can I ask you to save your questions for the end and to mute your mics. So in terms of introducing Leo, Leo was born in Greymouth in 1956. At just 15, a fiercely independent Leo left home and spent four years as an apprentice jockey. It was while working with horses in the UK that Leo realized he wanted to become a veterinarian. He recommenced high school as an adult student and then qualified as a vet. Leo stumbled into hospitality by chance in 1991 when he created a student bar called the Fat Ladies Arms in Palmerston North, which then grew to eight other locations. And in 1997, Leo decided to make Auckland his home. In Auckland 1999, Leo opened Euro on Auckland's waterfront, then Danny Doolins, and of course, we're all familiar with the iconic headquarters. While Leo is very well known for his hospitality ventures, what is less known is that Leo has always been a champion for social impact and social change, and in recent years has spearheaded numerous fundraisers and benevolent ventures to change the community for the better. Leo believes it's now time for him to give back to the community and go into public service. He says he's running for mayor of Auckland because he believes that our city's best days are ahead of us. He believes that Auckland's potential has been held back for far too long and that there's nothing stopping us from having a world-class city on the Pacific Rim to match the likes of Brisbane, Vancouver or San Francisco. Leo believes he has a plan to secure Auckland's future and help our city reach its full potential. We really look forward to hearing from you, Leo. Over to you. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to address you today. I have in recent times on my speaking tour been um, introducing myself as a person who has a vision uh, that I describe as the three C's. And I think I'll open and I'll close with that. So. The opportunity that I'm offering Auckland uh, is a chance um, to make a choice if they want change. Uh, if Auckland is happy with the status quo, if Auckland believes that we've been performing to our maximum capacity, if Auckland doesn't want to be activated, then they should not consider voting for me. But I believe through my life, my career, I have been an activator. Uh, in a strange way, hospitality is a good entree into a career of this nature. Uh, I'm known to like blood sports, for example, and I consider politics to be in the same category as blood sports. Um, I'm a vigorous, enthusiastic um, participant in any activity around town, uh, even at the arts and culture fringe, but I love my sports. I love to see a city that's vibrant, and I love to see people who smile. What I see now, unfortunately, is a city that's largely, and I'm going to borrow this phrase from Sir Peter Gluckman, I see a city, city that's been hollowed out. I see a city in a state of despair. And I see a city being run, uh, a council being hijacked by two or three ideologues and a city being run in a style that I would describe as more that of a cardboard cutout than a real personality. I think the city's ready for someone like me. I think I'm, in many ways I epitomise what the essence of Auckland is. Uh, some people find that polarising, but the reality is that Anybody who engages with me one-on-one -on -one would directly will know that I am a high achiever. I have um, a hectic pace I live my life at. I'm always busy. 
I'm well resourced, I'm well educated, and I think I have the appropriate set of skills, the range of skills, and the necessary independence to take this city by the scruff of the neck and give it a good shake. Because a shake is exactly what it needs. We are in a state of lethargy here. We're simply not performing at any level, no matter what metric you measure us by. We're seeing a city being vacated of our young talent. We're seeing a city that's being bullied and pushed out of shape by central government. And we're seeing a city that's being dumped on, not by one agency, not by two, but by multiple. The city is now so unsafe that you wouldn't send your children or your parents downtown after dark. It's in a sad state of affairs, but I am exactly the right person to fix it. I am fiercely independent. I am non-aligned. I have great vision. I'm well connected. And I think even at this stage, this embryonic stage that we're at now, we're finding that people are reaching out to us across all parties, from all agencies, from within the bowels of the City Council, and they're saying, we just want you to come in and give the place a shake. Dig out the layer of clay, get rid of the incompetence, give us some transparency, open the books, make us accountable, but most importantly, make us perform. So back to the three C's, I'm only doing an intro wrap here as I understand it, but tell me if you want me to keep speaking. Back to the three C's, you have a chance now. The electorate, the voters have a chance. The ratepayers have a chance. They need to consider and then make a choice. And the choice is for change, if you want Leo Malloy. Coruscating change, not just change. This will be a significant step in terms of the super city. We've had 12 years now of Len Brown and Phil Goff, both politically aligned, both hopelessly underachievers. Both have their strengths, not saying they're completely hopeless as individuals, but not fit to lead a city of this nature. They simply don't have the sizzle. They've got the sausage, but no sizzle. I've got the whole package and I'm the right man for the job. So consider it one more time. If you want coruscating change, vote for Leo Malloy. Awesome, thanks for that, Leo. We're now going to open up to the media panel. Today we have uh, Simon Wilson from The Herald, Todd Nile from Stuff, Patrick Smelly from Business Desk, and Mark Jennings from Newsroom. Uh, the panel have three minutes-ish uh, to ask a question and supplementary questions, and Leo gets a chance to answer, of course. And this this week, uh, with the with the invention of great technology, I have a noise. <laughs> which hopefully you can hear, which I'll hit, hit, uh, ring off at about the two minute 30 mark, just so you know there's about 30 seconds left to finish the question and for Leo to wrap up. So first off, uh, starting off with Simon from the New Zealand Herald. Thank you, Mark, and hi there, Leo. Now, Thank Leo, you, you're on, on record saying that after, in, in the coming months, a third to half of hospitality businesses will fail I wonder what you would do about that as mayor. Well, that's a very dynamic situation unfolding there, Simon. An interesting question, though, given my uh, role in, within hospitality. I actually thought it would have happened before now, but, and I do have my finger on the pulse with mainly the brewers and the big uh, breweries and the big suppliers who connect. And I think I may have exaggerated that figure slightly. It looks as though, short of a sugar rush, um, there are some disturbing figures coming to hand from around town about um, GDP and retail spending that would suggest there's a lot of places still in trouble. I looked at a very interesting article the other day from Precinct Properties about the state of the tenants in Commercial Bay. That didn't read well. But having said that, there's some evidence, uh, anecdotal evidence, of a resurgence in the viaduct. What I would like to see is some stronger leadership from central government, and particularly focused on the 130,000 public servants who are in the city and try and get people to come back to work and try and get them to move on from the climate of fear that did prevail for the last what two I'm, years. What I'm really getting at is that there's one school of thought that says we can't let businesses fail, everything's precarious and we've got to do all we can to help them survive. And there's another school of thought that says actually the way in which the healthy will survive is that if the, if the weak don't. Now, and that there will need to be that kind of change happening, creative destruction happening in your sector. And I, that's what I'm really interested in, as a, as a member of that sector, which school you fall into? Well, I think your, um, your second sentiment is the reflection of Stu Nash's um, philosophical approach to the problem. And I think it's callous and cruel. Uh, my view is that we should try, and particularly in a city of this nature that's so populated with immigrants, we should try and support your local Vietnamese noodle shop if you can. 
Um, there'll always be a survival of the fittest. That's the dynamic nature of hospitality. Any industry like ours that has a very easy entry level, you'll always find there's a lot of new operations coming on stream on any given day, week, month, year. And with the, those emerging, there's always the ones who are um, closing down inevitably. So it's just a normal part of the industry. But having said that, I would like to think, we've had very little targeted support from central government, but I'd like to think that a city without hospitality, without your cafes, et cetera, is a city without a heart. And that is a problem. That uh, depends what your vision is for the city. If you don't want to see Albert right. Street invigorated, then you don't need to worry about it. But if you want to see streets like Albert Street, or even down here below us in Fort Street, for example, if you want to see them populated, vibrant, energised, you need to have a hospitality sector. It's absolutely critical, and particularly critical around the waterfront if you go anywhere in the Mediterranean. Also, I want to ask you a personality question. It's been said about you that when you put the boot in, your customers buy more champagne. You are one of the most abrasive public figures in Auckland, possibly the country. I, I doubt you would disagree with that. And I wonder what makes you think that bringing that personality into politics will be helpful. I'm thinking in terms of, I mean, you, you're, you're an ex-bankrupt. I, I think a lot of business people understand that bankruptcy is a risk and that if you're entrepreneurial, um, it's a risk you take. Yeah. But that's not a risk that mayors take. I imagine you would agree with that. Yeah. And mayors have to be inclusive and mayors have to be cautious. And I wonder what, what it is that makes you think that your propensity to pick fights with people which you kind of jumped to, would make you a good mayor. Come on, you've met me at least two or three times now in secret. I'm a cuddly type, you know that. We get on well, you and I. <laughs> but I wondered where you'd go today, and I was looking Dude, for But that. you've also challenged me to a fight and abused me in that the process. Just, you know, that was just me winding you up. You know that. I wouldn't want to fight you. It would be a very one-sided affair, and I wouldn't do that. <laughs> Can I I'm comment on your bite. orange, your orange jersey, you. though? <laughs> You're looking great today, Simon, I've got to say. Thank you, you mate. Look Thank you. Now, getting back to your question, um, it was about my abrasive personality. Well, I don't know how to answer that one. I mean, I do. You're right. I've never been particularly affectionate with the media, but in the last couple of years, I have been. I think that my hospitality businesses we will come back to the bankruptcy later, if you don't mind. My hospitality businesses would not have thrived like they have if I didn't have a particularly engaging and charismatic personality. And I can engage with anybody and talk to anybody. And as some people say much, they're this may I talk far too much. So I think a lot of the myth around Leo Malloy is generated by the media because they don't understand me. But in the last two years, and I'm acknowledging there that I'm different in case you're wondering, I'm certainly not your average typical Kiwi. But in the last two years, I've had a pretty good run with the media. You won't hear me criticise in the media very often, uh, mainly because I think COVID gave me an opportunity to show a side or a dimension to Leo Malloy, not just the badass boy from Hospo, but about a guy who actually knew the science and understood virology and epidemiology and all those words that only I can say that people, no one could say when the virus first came to New Zealand. So, and just about everything I've said and pieces I've written for the Herald for your publication, they have all uh, proved to be absolutely correct. So. Now, I want to deal with the bankruptcy thing because I wonder which curveball you throw at me. That was a salutary lesson. Um, I made some critical mistakes that I'll never make again in my life. I did uh, develop a belief that whatever I did, I was bulletproof. And much to my dismay, I learned to the contrary that I was anything but. But I think it's an important lesson you learn in life. And it's like every other hurdle you hit in life. It's not when you go to ground and get covered in dust and dirt. It's how you get up and regroup and carry on with your life. And I think even you, Simon, would agree that I have a certain... I have a fairly um, resolute side to my character. I am formidable and I'm relentless and I'm fearless. I respect everyone, but I fear no one. And that'll be, right. that, that will define me and that will make me a great mayor for Auckland City. Has he had his three minutes yet, Mark? I've got to yeah, say. Mark, so I haven't heard the noise. No, that's, that is, it's over three minutes. Give him the boing boing, he's out. <laughs> I didn't, didn't, didn't hear it. I didn't <laughs> run because two of uh, Simon's supplementaries actually came through in feedback from our members as well. So that's been covered also. Simon, awesome. thank you for that. I do thank appreciate you. your assistance. I've got him smiling. Do I get extra points for having him smiling? Right, moving on. We'll go next to uh, Todd Nile from, from Stuff. So Todd, over to you. Hi, Leo. Um, I just want to try and join up some things you've said about transport and climate. You want to end the regional fuel tax. You oppose the congestion charge, you're against the parking strategy, and yet you say that we must implement climate-friendly policies. So given all that, how would you cut transport emissions by 64% by 2030? 
by 20 This seconds. is about to be the longest three minutes of your life, Todd, but let me make a correction first. I have never said I'm against congestion charging. What I have said, and I've said it repeatedly, and the day I first announced that I was going to run back in July, what that I would support... What the other day, though? Please, Todd, just let me do a little bit of speaking, if you don't mind. I, I enjoyed your article about the uh, Viv spend this morning, too. That was an interesting article. But let me come back to what I actually said, Todd. I said I wanted to do a free public transport trial using the reserves left over from the RFT, because I'm of the view that our public transport system is not fit for purpose. And I want to measure it using KPIs. I want to see if there is actually an appetite for a different style of public transport in Auckland. And it may well be we'll have more ferries. It might have less, less buses. It might have a different type of bus. And I'm not against cycleways, for example. But I think it's got to be an or situation, not an and situation. You can't have main arterial routes coming off the motorway with lycra-crad cyclists going up and down like Tamaki Drive. You're better off to plan your cycleways and your walkways. And I think Simon's commented on that one from Green Bay to um, Teatitu, which I'm quite excited about. I'm going to go and try it myself. And I think that's a great opportunity, like the Lake Dunstan one in central Otago. But this is all about planning and getting it right. Now, coming back to public transport, I've also argued strongly that we should be looking at green hydrogen as an option for uh, dealing with emissions. And while we're on the subject of emissions, you, have I still got you, Todd? You haven't gone to sleep on me, have you? You've still got you? That's great. So while we're on the subject of emissions, have you had a, a, any sort of analytical um, uh, perspective or a look at what's happened since COP26 in Glasgow? Have you had a look at which countries agreed to buy into the no coal use, no coal mining, no coal ban, and which ones didn't? Because let me remind you, if you haven't, India, the United Kingdom, Australia, and China, 65% of global emissions said no to reduction in coal. China's increased their coal production by 300 million tonnes a year since COP26. So anything you say is just virtue signalling. I'm all in favour of trying to meet your emissions targets, but do it in a constructive, expansive, visionary, scientific way. Have a look at green hydrogen. Have a look at the opportunity down at TY Point. Have a look at the opportunity in the Kaipara Harbour. Don't pretend that you're going to do something for emissions by going to a vegan cafe to eat a certain type of sandwich. It's just, you're only making yourself feel good. You're not going can to just, achieve can I, can, I just come, can I come back to the question, though? That's all very good. So eight years to go, how would you cut transport emissions by 64%? Well, let me tell you, it's not just transport emissions for a start. In that particular document, it says that heating a building... Question. Heating of buildings has to be cut by 65% too. So my question to you, have you turned down the temperature or the air conditioning in your building? No, you haven't. You're launching attack after attack after attack on the 80% of people who choose electively, and New Zealand is a country of choice in case you've forgotten, to drive private motor vehicles or travel in private motor vehicles. So yes, I will do my bit for to meet the emissions targets, but I'll keep it in perspective and context, and it will definitely involve green hydrogen technology for the heavy vehicle fleet, ferries, buses, trains. So you're not seeing the 64% as a must-do? I'm seeing it as much of a must-do as I'm seeing you dropping the temperature in your building by 65%, which is in the same document in case you didn't hear me the first time. Yeah, sorry, can I just get a clear answer on that? 64%? Yes, you can. Go and get the thermostat behind you and turn your building temperature down. And when you feel comfortable, come back to me. Because you can't just keep targeting one. There are four key areas in that document, and the heating of your building is one of the key areas. The second highest, I think it might even be the highest, 64% BB65, in case you've forgotten. So car emissions, vehicle emissions is one element. Agriculture and heating buildings. You must have had this three minutes by now, surely, Mark. Right, moving on now. Nice sidestep, thank you. Moving on now to Patrick from uh, Business Desk. Morning, Leo. Morning, Patrick. Um, I'm going to give you a bit of a gimme because um, your opening uh, remarks made a great play of, of there will be change. Uh, can't remember the word you used. Was it excoriating uh, Corus change? Coruscating. Coruscating change. But you didn't actually really leave me with a sense of what would change as a result of you being mayor. If you were to think of one very significant legacy that the Leo Malloy mayoralty would leave for Auckland, what would that be? Well, shall I take the liberty of expecting that you know what coruscating means? And for the people out there who are watching who don't, I'll explain to them. 
the, the definition in the Oxford Dictionary will say something along, I see Mark Jennings is smiling, he clearly knows exactly what it means. It means a flash of brilliance, which I will definitely bring to the city, but it also means you can be hypercritical. So I'm also, uh, on that basis, hypercritical of the city's performance, their lack of performance, I should say. Uh, I'll use your equity investments as a really good example to explain to you, given your business knowledge, projected, projected in the 1920 and the 2021, 3% and 4% respectively, actually realised minus 73, minus 80%. That is a city in big, big trouble. And if you need more examples of a city in trouble, look at the ports model. Look at the ports. I have already had an opportunity to speak to people who have significant waterfront investments about the leasehold opportunity at the ports. Notice I said leasehold, not selling freehold. They are of the view it's worth 10,000 a square. There's 77 hectares, nearly 200 acres there at 10,000 a square. Do the math. That's an $8 billion investment returning nothing in rates. Their interim dividend this year declared 2.1 million. Now, let's say the ops company itself is worth three. That's a 10 billion asset, declaring what they described as a satisfactory 2.1 million. Really? Is that a return on investment? Is that being well managed? And that's the city's biggest asset. In all seriousness, if I couldn't turn that from its current value, and the land value has nothing because it returns nothing, but I will turn it into 7 billion, and I took the ops company and sold it to Ports of Tauranga, which is now worth, as you know, on the stock exchange, 4.4 billion as we speak today, I would immediately write a cheque for the city there of 11 or $12 billion, which would get rid of every single cent of debt. Now, having dealt with that hypercritical coruscating, let's go back to the real coruscating. Do you want a city that is really sizzling with events? Do you want Philharmonic playing up in Cornwall Park? Do you want a stadium that's fit for purpose? I mean, look at your four stadia in this city. Look at Auckland Unlimited. What did they deliver last year at Auckland Unlimited? If you haven't read their annual report, I'll tell you what they delivered. They named four items. Three of them were Costco, Ikea. How is that a delivery? They're both private enterprises. And the third one of the four was the America's Cup, which they delivered delightfully into the hands of Barcelona. Tell me, is that a city that's accountable? Is that a city that has an open book transparency about it? Is that a high performing city? Is that a city worthy of its place on the Pacific Rim? Let me tell you right now, no, 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 and no. So fair enough, uh, but to be, also to, to, to be fair, those are almost exactly the points on both the Port and Auckland Unlimited that Wayne Brown, who's massively out polling you, if the one poll that we've had any look at is correct, uh, so what's your differentiating proposition? Well, I come from Auckland. I'm charismatic. <laughs> I'm charming. I smile. I'm not angry. I'm not a wannabe surfer. I don't have a history of not paying my rates. I don't own land on the Whangarei Harbour where I'm trying to shift the ports to. Any other things you want me to itemise for you? I'm Leo. Yeah, yeah, I'm what, what, you, yeah, what you're for. What you're for. That I'm for what? You from I, I think my, I think my uh, performance in Auckland members. speaks for itself, Patrick. Over 25 odd years now, I've performed consistently in Auckland. I've been a great employer for Auckland. I've added a lot of value to people's lives. I mean, hospitality, when you think about it, it's an added value experience and you expect things like security, you expect performance, you expect something that you wouldn't perhaps get at home. And I think that's the opportunity as the mayor, is to make a city perform, give people security. You can't do too much more than that. By the way, can I ask you a question, Patrick? Sure. Who's Wayne Brown? Hey, he's, he's a bloke who was on here last week, saying lots of the same things as you, in a less colourful fashion. <laughs> yes. Yes, well, that's probably, you, you made the essential uh, differentiation point there yourself. Next, please. Come on, gentlemen, line up. On the jackets, thanks, Leo. You have an email for Wayne Brown on the jackets. Wait, yeah. Good luck. Uh, now, going uh, Mark, Mark, I've got an idea. Why don't you tell our fine lineup of yesterday the little job that you assigned me? Because I'm quite proud of that job. Is that an opportune moment to tell that story, or should I tell it for you? All right. Move on to Mark Jennings now from uh, from Newsroom. Mark, if you're, I think I saw you online. Yeah. Unmute, I think, Mark. You might be muted. They want your priority. Um, thanks for that. Sorry, I was muted. Um, uh, look, I'm interested in uh, public transport, which has been touched on by some of the other uh, journalists yeah, yeah. here. Um, you're very critical of AT, and in fact, you're going to sack them, I think. How, how would you actually improve 
public transport in Auckland right now? Well, probably the first thing you do is you try and, as I said, run your one-year free trial, see who actually wants public transport. Because one thing I do know for sure is that if I ask around the room, nine people out of ten will say they want better public transport. But when you say who for, it's never for them. It's for, always for everyone else. And I'm sure you're well aware that I've been uh, undertaking a project counting ghost buses over at the Easter period in particular, where on one morning I got to 25 buses, two of which were double-deckers before I found one with a passenger on it. Whoever's rostering or running that model is not using a fit-for-purpose model. Now, I'm not against expanding Auckland Transport, but I think after a one-year trial measuring the key KPIs, like emissions, which will make Todd happy, like usage factor, frequency, we might look at them what well, I call them Venus routes, they're probably called feeder routes, and say we need more of that, we need less of that, we need a different type of modality, different type of bus. We might even need a few more walkways, which will make Simon happy. But I think we should look to it ferries. I think ferries add a certain flavour, a certain panache to a city, and I don't think we have enough of them. So in answer to your question, my view would be not that we should... Well, let's, no, let's go back to talking transport for a start. I think any entity that has 1,600 staff and a $2 billion budget and is meeting the pushback and criticism that they are, doesn't stand scrutiny. There are some serious issues. And if you look at their vision statement, they use lots of those fancy fluffy words like um, collaboration, and all those sort of words, but they don't comply with anything. They just charge on and do whatever they want to do. And it's almost like we have to suffer the consequences. And I, in particular, um, and I can see one listener up there who knows exactly when this happened. We had our street, without any notice, any formal warning at all, turned from a two-way main arterial street servicing the hospitality sector, turned into a one-way street predominantly for biking, for cycling. And we now live in a building with, I'm going to say, 150 apartments. We have a circle around the outside for cyclists. And I don't think there's a single person who lives in that building who owns a push bike. Actually, I'm telling a lie, there is one person. So I just think there's a lot of not fit for purpose activity going on there. And I think the mayor should have a more of a hands-on role. As you know, it's the one CCO where we can have two members on the board. Funnily enough, the three council advisors are involved, one of whom is Bill Cashmore, who is going to retire, so I won't speak poorly of Bill. But he has 3,000 acres out of the River Point to park, like 3,000 acres to park his car and his truck and his ute and whatever else he wants. But he wants to strip 1,200 kilometres of city parking away. So Mr and Mrs Average from Struggle Street have just arrived from Vietnam or Cambodia and trying to sell their noodles to make a living. No one can stop there anymore. Or the bloke who just set up a nice suit for hire shop. No one can stop there anymore to hire a suit. So they're going to force all these small businesses out of business with what they're doing, force all the people who need parking and want to travel in a car to the malls. And I ask you now a question in reverse. Do you want to live in a city dominated by malls or do you want to live in a city with precincts and suburbs that have their own beating heart and their own attractive proposition to add value to your life? Well, are you saying that people don't use public transport because they'd rather use cars or the transport system's useless? Or what? why is there only one person on, on the bus? Well, maybe that's something you should ask, ask Auckland Transport, and it's certainly something that I'll be asking them. But let's agree that I think 80% of the people in the last census, 75 drove their cars and five travelled as passengers. And I think 1.8% used push bikes to go to and from. So if you eliminate the Lycra crowd on Tamaki Drive on the weekend, you've probably got 1.5% used push bikes to go to work. Isn't it a wee bit of a tail wagging the dog situation at the moment? And I'm not against getting people out of cars. I'm not against reducing emissions. I'm not against expanding the public transport system. What I'm saying is I don't think in its current form it's fit for purpose. So give us an opportunity to run a one-year trial. Unlike Auckland Transport, which doesn't seem to have any business model in advance and certainly doesn't measure KPIs afterwards to see what they've done to Hurstmere Road or what they've done to Onihanga, I will do exactly that. I will have a model in advance and I will measure it after. And after a one-year free trial, we'll actually see who wants free public transport in Auckland. Does Grey Lynn want free public transport or does Manuewa and Mangari? I suspect the answer will be the south side of town will want it badly and want a lot more of it because at the moment they spend between 45 and $70 a week on public transport. For. But if it's free, you might find Mr. and Mrs. Average from out in Mangari or Manukau or wherever, they will take the train or the bus into town on the weekend to take the kids down to play on the waterfront. Oh, that's right. You can't play on the waterfront in Auckland unless you're a rich white man with a 70-foot yacht. Sorry about that. Let me fix that too. It won't be hard to fix. But do you see where I'm going with this, Mark? Yeah. Yep, must be able to see my vision. Yeah, no. Um, a couple of quick more sort of uh, personal questions. 
How much of your own money are you sinking into this campaign? Well, I won't talk uh, in gross figures because it's unfair to put other candidates at a potential disadvantage by saying I've got more than you. But the reality is that I've put the first um, about six months of money in myself and we had a very pleasant surprise about two weeks ago. A group of significant people from around town asked to convene a lunch at one of my establishments and they put the hat around and they, they did make a significant contribution. There's been one other significant donor since. But I will just tell you now that as we speak that my investment so far is between three and four and we have a long, long, long way to go. So uh, there will be opportunities along the way for people to get involved if they want to, but I'm pretty comfortable where I sit now. And I believe that the, the main and most compelling reason why I should have put that magnitude, that, that amount of money in, is because people have to believe that you're credible and genuine. And that's the issue I've always struggled with with the media. Is he credible? Is he genuine? Is he taking the piss? Is he just trying to insert himself into a headline anymore? Well, the clear answer now is no. No one wastes that figure that I've mentioned, I could have gone and bought myself another house if I wished with that figure, but I chose not to. I want to give to the city and I'm prepared to pay the price to do it. And by the time we finish this and I finish funding it, and I've got a guaranteed three years, but I'll almost certainly serve nine, I will be worse off than I was as we sit here today. It will cost me money to be the mayor of the city. It'll also cost me a lot of emotional stress. It'll cost me a lot of abuse. It'll cost me 120 hours a week for seven days a week. And I got that from an ex-mayor because when I decided in July to do this job, I went to him and I said, help me understand exactly what I'm getting in for here. Help me understand the commitment. So all I'm telling you now, Mark, is that I'm doing this in the most benevolent, sacrificial, altruistic way you could possibly do. And I'm getting a hell of a beating from it already, emotionally and financially. I've got people stopping me in the street saying, can you fix the potholes outside my house already? So I'm prepared for nine years. It might end up taking more than nine years to fulfill my vision, but I'm giving a lot to the city because I want to make the city. I don't want to use the word great, but I do want to make this city great. I want to make it fantastic and I want to make it glitter. And the crown of the Pacific Rim, I want this to be the shining diamond. Thank you. These questions, but questions come through, Leo. Uh, people have asked three to four, three to four what in terms of money? Three to four thousand. $30, $40 million, what, what sort of money they're talking about? Uh, well, for, well I, I've kind of already played that hand, so I'm to tell you. I think we're in the hole for about three fifty dollars of my own money or something so far. So I guess it's going to be, it's probably going to end up a hell of a lot more. I can tell you our budget is about four times that. So, But then, you know, this is not a who's got the biggest wizard competition. I mean, Wayne Brown will probably come back on tomorrow and say, I've got more money than you. Good luck to him. I couldn't care how much he's got. In fact, someone else told me that there's a guy called Tim who started IHUG is going to run next week and he professes to be worth significant money as in rich listers. So it's, I don't know if it's about how much money you've got anyway. Chloe Swarbrick ran on 10 grand, didn't she? She got a lot of votes. You know, you can capture a certain sector, but you don't have to use expensive techniques like news talk ZB and Mike Hosking. I mean, we have a social following. Uh, I've got an advisor sitting to my right, in case you're wondering why I keep looking to my right, who's telling me to sit up and talk up, which I'm doing. But um, we, we, in one social media post, we reached one in five New Zealanders. That was only about six weeks or eight weeks ago. So those little pieces I do to camera are incredibly powerful. And I won't name them, but two very high-profile media people told me they were four pieces nine times in one day of me talking to camera about my life and, and the city, how I saw it, and, and what it might have all went to under my control. Guy who's likely to take out the the presidency in the Philippines has run his campaign via TikTok. So I think you know there's there's lots of ways to get in front of people. That brings He's to a Marcos, isn't he? That's that bon bon Marcos. I mean, how would you have another Marcos? It's like having a uh, one of those young Trumps becoming president in twenty years' time. We can't believe how people are so forgiving. It's extraordinary how they forget so quickly. Now moving on to the next part of the uh, of our format this morning. We've got some questions that have come through from uh, various members across the Business Association, which of course, to remind everybody, questions from Newmarket, Parnell, Ponsonby, Uptown, and Karanga Happy Road. So one of the, the top questions which we're getting a lot, of, a lot of traction with at the moment, a lot of feedback on, is crime. And obviously Auckland right now is having a hell of a time with crime, especially from a retail and hospitality perspective where, you know, uh, dairies, shops, luxury stores are being hammered with ram raids and smashing graves all the time. So what could Auckland Council under your leadership do to help in this area? 
So it's a good question, whoever proposed the question. It's something that's been quite dear to my heart for some months now. I first started going to Fort Street and doing pieces to camera there, trying to bring the media and draw them in to, to engage in the conversation. I don't think the City Council or Heart of the City have been um, performing to the required standard in dealing with crime in that part of the world. And we've seen it now manifest itself in a rash of uh, ram raids, for example. I think as a mayor, you have to engage uh, intensely with the police. You have to have, I've spoken to the area commander, who's a very pleasant chap, the new area commander, Gray Davison, I think his name is. And I've said to him, look, if we can find a spare building, will you move back downtown? And I'm sure I'm allowed to tell you this. They've got a building in Federal Street. They're going to put something in there on a temporary basis. But I would find a city building somewhere and get boots on the ground downtown. And it's not a it's not a simple equation here. You know, some of these kids, as you all probably know, I'm fairly tight with Dave Latelli and his father, Dave, through the Butterbean Foundation and Grace Foundation. And we have these conversations all the time. This is not about tasers and long batons and going beating up on 10 or 11 or 12 year old kids because there's always layers, there's always complexities. You know, it's intergenerational stuff. You've got to, on the one hand, give security and safety to the small business community, deal with what I delightfully described as the young punks uh, in an old school style, but simultaneously address the intergenerational problems that are causing. And why are kids, what is it about these young kids that they've suddenly got an appetite for what's really nothing more than vandalism? I see last night they did a shop over for vapes and for orange drinks or something ridiculous. I mean, really? They're risking a crime a conviction for doing that? It's not the, the motivating factor. It's not as simple as just saying, I want to be a career criminal. It's not as simple as saying, I want to go and steal a Louis Vuitton bag. There is something, a disconnect, that's probably more of a central government problem than a local government problem. But there's an intergenerational disconnect where these kids are now out at night in cars showing off. And the old fashioned people will be saying, well, it's probably social media. Because what happens quite clearly is one group of them go on social media and say, guess what we're going to do now? We're going to ram raid the Ormiston Mall. And the rest of them watch it and go, wow, how cool was that? What a rush that was, adrenaline rush. And they go, go and start copycat. Do you know, I hope Ponsonby's watching here, and I'd like to think your question came from Ponsonby. Someone told me they drove down Ponsonby Road the other day, and you do see this in some suburbs of town like Panmure, but about four or five shops were busy installing those metal grills that you pull up and down to give yourself protection at night. Now, if that is true, I should go and fact check that and make sure it is true. But if it's true, that's a sad indictment of the state of the city, isn't it? And I guess the question is, how do we get to this? Well, I'll tell you how we got to this. You got to this because central government has been allowed to keep dumping on the inner city, dumping MIQs, dumping 501s, dumping DSW people, dumping uh, people who are doing the transition from jail back into normal society, and they've met no resistance. Well, I'll tell you now, they'll be meeting a lot of resistance when I become mayor, because that will not be acceptable anymore, and we will get this city back to where it belongs. And on that note, we need more young students and more young visa type immigrant labour force people back in the Fort Street area and back in the inner city to make this city feel like it actually has a beating heart again. I think crime is very topical for all of us. I'm sure you're sure you're painfully aware of that. Now moving on to the next question, which is around the current CCO model. Uh, for example, the likes of Auckland Transport, Watercare, Pamuku, Auckland Unlimited, etc., operating currently at an arm's length from the council. What would you do as mayor to improve performance of the CCOs, Auckland Transport, as an example? And you may we'll deal with them one. We'll deal, I'll come. I'll do Auckland Transport last because it's the most complicated. Let's deal with the first two. Water care, great little business, twelve billion dollar balance sheet, uh, two billion dollars worth of debt, so net ten billion equity, uh, makes eight hundred million a year. After depreciation, pays about a two fifty million dividend every year. The first thing I'll be saying is, why are we giving in, caving in to this government? and selling for 500 million to fix Northland's problems. That is an absolute no-go zone. That asset is worth a lot of money, and that's ratepayers' money. So that should be preserved in its own, um, the entity that it exists in now. It's perfectly functional. It might need a few upgrades, but there's some good upgrade work coming on stream this, uh, this year, I think it is, with the interceptors both, coming, both being activated this year. Next one, unlimited. Uh, budget last year, 50 million. What did they deliver? Absolutely nothing. Nothing for the arts, nothing for cultural, nothing for sports significant. Four stadia that don't work. A zoo, really? Motat doesn't work. Unlimited is absolutely not fit for purpose and should be wound up tomorrow. I should take charge of Unlimited and do it myself. I could do it with a panel of five people and I could do a far better job. So that's two dealt with. Who haven't we done? We'll come back to transport last. We've done water care, Unlimited. Panuku. Eki Panuku. Well, here we go. This is a good subject. 
managing the city council's land assets and managing them poorly. I'm sure you're well aware of what's happening with Waipurua Trust in the courts as we speak with John Tamahiri, my very dear friend, matter of disclosure there. I'm delighted to hear that John Tamahiri is running for mayor too. I'm excited because it's getting a wee bit busy out in the centre-right space and now that JT's running, it just helps to split that left vote a wee bit and I'll be supporting JT whenever possible. But Eki Panuku there, out in Papatauitau, what they did to, to Waipurua Trust is a disgrace. Eki Panuku does not have any mandate to decide how much community housing or how much of the um, social housing that you have in any particular development. That's not their job, but it's a typical example of a CCO and David Rankin was in charge, in case you forgot at the time, thinking that they don't answer to anyone, they certainly don't answer to council or to the mayor. They have their own mandate, their own ideologic, ideological, philosophical approach to how to deal with issues, but they don't. That's not their right, it's not their job. So you would take those land assets either out of their control completely, divest of the ones that are surplus to requirements, invest in the ones that do uh, have potential to have value added to them by rezoning or whatever, or creating community housing. In fact, here's a good story, but it'll take a while. Avondale Racecourse, watch that space. There's a heads up for you boys, those media boys. Right, Avondale Racecourse down now and start digging around and finding what's going on there with Kangaroo, because there's a big, big play going on there. Now, the last one, Auckland Transport. 40% of the council budget, underperformer. Am I the only critic? No. Do they have any supporters? Not really. Are they delivering on what their promises are in their vision statement? Not at all. Are they fit for purpose, living in the Vodafone building and whatever it is, 16,000 square metres with the best car parking to floor plate ratio in Auckland? No. Is it one rule for me and one rule for thee with them? Absolutely. Uh, do they ride to work? If they don't, they should. Uh, I just don't think there's anything about Auckland Transport that makes sense to me, in particular their elitist behaviour, appalling behaviour, spending $14 million a kilometre on a bikeway and walkway from Point Chev through to connecting up with Greylin, as I understand it. A $50 million vanity project with no basis, in fact, and no business model to substantiate or support it. Is that enough? Right, thank you for that. Uh, moving on now, so... Business associations, of which there are five on this call, to, four or five on this call today, um, are funded, and there's been some media around this, funded by a targeted rate on commercial property. Uh, it's managed through a democratically approved ballot and governed by a board under a constitution. So all of the 50 business associations or the bids across Auckland are managed by a board under a constitution. What are your thoughts on the bid program? I think there are some sad stains that reflect on every other bid badly. There are some good ones. Out West, Howick, for example, they don't spend their budget. The one that you all should be looking at, and I mean microscopically at how it's being used currently, is the heart of the city. Uh, 5.6 million budget last year, still couldn't keep to budget. 1.6 million on personnel expenses. Uh, I have an email trail in my possession where they tried to hide the fact that there were brewing, festering problems with crime in the inner city. I literally have that email. I'm happy to share it with the media when it's appropriate. They have lived a lie for a long time. They've lived beyond their means. They've delivered absolutely nothing. So if you want to do a compare and contrast on bids and you want me to name a good one, try Howick. Uh, I'd quite like Ponsonby. I'd like to get more involved with Ponsonby, actually, if they want to come connect up with me. But I think the one that's failed to deliver in every single possible way using every metric to measure them by is heart of the city. And you should have a serious, serious look at Heart of the City, you guys. It needs to be taken apart, dismantled, 14 staff, and are seeking one more as we speak, and put it back together. Put it back together in a way that works for the Heart of the City. Because at the moment, it's all about ripping the heart out of the city. And they're standing back and watching. I think the, the mandate for business associations, though, is quite complex and, you know, a lot of us manage CCTV networks, we provide security, graffiti removal, advocacy with council and local, local and central government. And often though, our hands are often tied behind our back because we are just an advocacy body, but actually the, the powers of council and central government can really have, uh, make it very difficult for us to, to achieve what we need to achieve. So I think, you know, there is that to take into account as well, but we won't dwell on that. Uh, looking at infrastructure projects in Auckland, obviously uh, Auckland is going through a continued growth trajectory, uh, despite uh, some pending gloom, doom and gloom of a recession which may be around the corner, Auckland is very likely to continue to grow uh, over the next sort of 20, 10, 20, 30 years. How could council better support the growth of the city? Well, clearly the opportunity is in the uh, private-public partnerships. 
uh, we can't keep putting excessive demands on ratepayers. Mr and Mrs Average from Struggle Street cannot survive at the rate we're living beyond our means. So we have to go into that private public partnership model. Um, that's the only way I can see any way forward for significant infrastructure investments. And once you get into that model and you accept that it's a viable model, I'll be interested to hear what Patrick Smalley thinks about this. Um, I, I think it's something we should probably have been contemplating before now. We should probably have looked at a downtown waterfront stadium using that model with a cultural centre to go with it. I think it's very fundable, very doable. There'll probably be a good return on investment. It'll invigorate the city. So that's how I would look at it. I would look at ratepayers as being the drain on their resources is already so significant, you can't tax them into oblivion, which is a reason why we shouldn't be considering the light rail project to the airport because of the demands it puts on Mangari, Mount Roskill, the suburbs that can least afford it. So I think, yeah, the opportunity, the exciting opportunity is to look at bringing in pension funds, ACC, KiwiSaver, or global entities who are interested in those sort of private public equity partnerships. And if anybody's had the opportunity to read City Deal's document, which I think is a price waterhouse to give them credit, document out of the UK, which started with Manchester, but is now spread across about 15 cities in the UK, and I think they're activating it in Australia. It's an excellent document, although it's more of a central government relationship with local government, that one, but you could just substitute central government for private equity partners. I have one last question, then I'll hand over to Cheryl for any questions she may have, then we'll come back to you to wrap up and do your final, uh, your final pitch. Um, what infrastructure projects, if any, would you take to Wellington and champion on behalf of Auckland? Uh, well, I think I've made it really clear. Can I st speak metaphorically first and just say this? Because there is a criticism of me that I'm too central city centric or viaduct centric, depending on who you're talking to. The metaphor that I use to explain to people when I'm working the burbs, it's like a giant tree in the forest. The root structure you can't see, but it reaches far and wide to draw on nutrients and sustenance. The trunk has to be strong to survive. So the trunk is clearly the CBD and the canopy gives you the shelter and the protection that you need to flourish. So if you look at the CBD as an opportunity to reinvigorate the city, the clear, it is, this is screaming, and I don't know why it hasn't been done before. It is so obvious. You get rid of the ports. I can sell that ports operating company to 10 different operators tomorrow. You go to Kawakawa Point, I think it's called it Kawakawa Bay, just down in the further Thames. You put two floating ports there. You could even bring in your international cruise ships there. And suddenly, suddenly, you've got people competing for business like they have at Botany in Australia and Sydney where they moved the port in 79 in case you forgot, and you invigorate the waterfront. When you invigorate the waterfront, the opportunities are limitless. They built the Opera House, I think Utsun was his name, Utsun, he was a Scandinavian architect, for 115 million. Can you imagine Sydney now without the Sydney Opera House, or without the rocks? They define the city. Every major city in the world has moved their port. The opportunity here is to get that port out of there yesterday. It is ludicrous how they've been continued to exist, paying no rates, no return on investment, can't compete with all the other ports in New Zealand. And yet there's 200 acres here that could allow the city access to the water. We could pitch for the Commonwealth Games coming up in, in 34 if you want to. We could put swimming pools like they have in Bondi in Australia. We could put an arts and culture centre like the Sydney Opera House. We could put a stadium, a 50,000 seater, because the four stadia you've got in the city now are not fit for purpose. They've all got major design faults. Eden Park, for example, you can't play five-day cricket there. And you know, how many concerts are you allowed a week there, uh, um, a year, I mean? I think it's at six or 10 or something. Ludicrous figures, ludicrous limitations on a city that should be vibrant. And that would be my number one priority when I take this city over, or when I become mayor of the city, don't take it over. I don't want to sound too authoritarian. But I will definitely be campaigning to get that ports moved ASAP. And we've already got the wheels in motion there. And to get that cultural centre that I want in the city so richly deserves, and um, for Fatua as well, in case you're wondering, I see Fatua as being critical and involved in this, and selling the long-term long -term lease in perpetuity on that 77 hectares, and that includes using the proceeds of sale to build a 50,000-seater stadium that does the city proud. Thanks, Mark. Um, Leah, just one or two small uh, questions from me. You've been very vocal about the parking strategy, um, and I don't think you need to say any more about it, but I need to just say I think that resonated with a lot of Parnell businesses. Um, I think they were very happy for your advocacy in that, in that, on that topic. What I would like to know is you're very passionate and speak about events and arts and culture. If it's not Auckland Unlimited, who would you see initiating all of this and bringing this back to Auckland? And how would you sell the brand of Auckland? You know, that, that brand we want to sell to international tourists and visitors. Okay, do you remember when Jeff Kennett became Premier of Victoria, Cheryl? 
the, the, before you. Cheers, sadly, sorry. <laughs> So Jeff Kennett went and he became Premier with a, a, an unapologetic vision. He said quite blatantly, I'm going to take every decent, significant sporting and cultural event from every state in Australia, and they're all coming to Victoria. It's not negotiable. The one that everybody remembers is Formula One, which he took from Adelaide. Now, that would be my view and my attitude. So we're already engaging with the, um, the Art Gallery. We're engaging with the Philharmonic yesterday. We're talking about opportunities. And I have this idea where you have five or six really big thinkers, and Auckland doesn't have that many big thinkers, and I don't want to name them, but we've already got five or six who we think would make a panel who would develop every facet of that activity-based um, economy that would drive the city, the culture, the arts, the sports, etc. And even then, I think we have a roving ambassador who travels the world and just looks for events, and I'm particularly interested in participation events. I don't, I'm not talking about Tyson Fury fighting Joe Parker, uh, and Joe's back in town. Hi, Joe, if you're watching this. Um, but Tyson Fury, Joe Parker is a one-off event where you might get 30 or 40,000 people come into town for one night. I want participation events, World Masters Games, Commonwealth Games, things like that. When it comes to cultural events, I want sequences and series of events, big stuff, stuff that drives a city's economy, stuff that changes the complexion of a city, not small one-off stuff. But here's another example, car racing. Have we ever done anything for car racing in the city? And in case you're wondering, the Rally of New Zealand is coming back and they're going to run it off um, North Wharf, I call it. What's that place over there where the tank farm was? It's going to be run from there. So that'll be exciting at the end of this year. But we could embrace car racing in, in the city, couldn't we? Surely. I mean, I'm not into cars particularly. I'm not into car racing particularly. But all I see there is an opportunity to reach out to somebody. New Zealand's got a famous, the support base for car racing, the Gill Traps and the Peter Johnsons, those sort of people. We're not utilising those people's strengths or assets. They are valuable individuals, valuable members of our community, just going to waste. Thank you. Thanks, Leo. We'll give you now a couple of minutes just to wrap up and do your final uh, big pitch to convince us all that you're the man to lead Auckland into the future. Well, all I can say is that I've been watching Simon uh, Wilson, who may well have been diametrically opposed to me before we got to know each other quite well, and I've noticed him smiling quite a lot, as has Mark Jennings, so I'm winning two hearts out of the four. Patrick Smelly's disappeared from the telly, I don't know where he's gone to, and Todd seems to be quite benign, and at the end of the day, I've only got to convince the media. Hello, Patrick, nice to see you back. Um, how's the crew out there? I haven't been to the business desk. Have you got an office up in Graham Street or somewhere? Where do you cohabitate or habitate? Now you've muted yourself again. I'll keep talking because Patrick's muted. Uh, most media I meet are London. Bottom of Shorten Street. Bottom of Shorten Street. I should come and meet you one day. I'm in Shorten Street now, actually. Um, in fact, I'm going back down to Shorten Street into Fourth Street soon because, incredibly, half of the city today has decided to set up mini golf in Fourth Street. And I think my feelings about half of the city's performance are quite well known. I was absolutely staggered when I come around the corner about nine o'clock this morning looking for a coffee and a muffin and saw someone setting up a putt-putt course in Fort Street. But there you go, that's how life works at the heart of the city. Now, getting back to why you would vote for Leo, well, I told you I opened the batting with the three Cs. I mean, there's no limit to how many Cs you can use to describe Leo Malloy. Um, charismatic, stop laughing, Kate Cordy. My comms person beside me is laughing at that. Um, I told you, you have a chance. I'm giving you a chance to make a difference. You have a choice. And when you make a choice as a voter, it should always be a considered choice. I'm not here for entertainment. You need to look at my strengths and my weaknesses and then decide, do you want to embrace the opportunity? Do you really want change? And I use the word change reluctantly because Obama campaigned on it twice and I'd hate to try and pretend that I'm anything compared to Obama. But I can tell you now that I am absolutely and definitely an activator and I'm an agent for change. I'm a catalyst for change. I have a coruscating, charismatic personality. Got that word again, Patrick? Write it down, coruscating. I am the right man for the job. If you want to set this city alight, if you want to make it a great city, if you want to give it energy, if you want law and order, if you want productivity, you want business, you want safety, security, you want it populated, you want energy, you want to make it a city you're proud of, not a city that people are leaving like rats off a sinking ship, let's make this the ship that everybody wants to climb back on. That's my opportunity for you. I think I've sold myself well to you today. It's over to you to decide. I guess I'll read the papers tomorrow. But I can tell you, with regard to the polling, and I don't know what Patrick Poll's been, uh, what poll Patrick's been reading, but all our polling says, all our polling says, and we've got four polls in our position now, that there's a massive appetite for what I'm bringing to the table. People are tired of the same old thing. They're tired of non-delivery. They're tired of vanilla-style politics. They're tired of your Len Browns and your Phil Goffs. They're tired of party alignment where you can't say you, what you really want to do because the party pulls you back into line. People are looking for independence. 
They're looking for courage. They're looking for vision. They're looking for leadership. And they're looking for Leo. And they'll found him. Thank you, Leo. Thank you so much for your time this morning, giving us some insights into how you would be if you were the mayor of, uh, of Auckland. Special thanks too to, uh, to the media panel, Simon from the Herald, Todd from staff, Patrick from Business Desk, and Mark from Newsroom. Um, also my colleague, Cheryl and Parnell, Viv from Ponsonby, Brent from Uptown, and Jamie from Karanga Happy Road. Thanks guys for joining us. Thank you everyone for joining us. This will be posted online uh, later today, so you can go back and catch your favorite bit, listen to them all over again. And then next week we will have, uh, we will have Viv Beck at 10.30 on Thursday, the 19th, uh, same time, same place. Is it a fashion parade? I might turn up again if it's a fashion parade. <laughs> oh, well, it's, it's fine up to you, Leo. But anyway, thanks everyone. Take care, stay safe, and uh, see you again next week. Thank you.